Hey, True Believers, England team here, and it's time for another comic book origins. In this case, we're talking about the Scarecrow. Now, this is the second Marvel Scarecrow, and, of course, the third because we know of uh, DCs. They actually renamed him Straw Man after a while. So I went out and looking for any kind of information for this intro, and uh, what I found out was this thing just could not get off the ground, ladies and gentlemen. So the Scarecrow is created by Scott Edmund and Rico Rivell in 1975, the first appearance, Dead of Night, number 11, which we're going to be checking out here. It was originally supposed to be in Monsters Unleashed and Giant Size Werewolf. Uh, those were canceled. He was supposed to be in a Scarecrow title. That got canceled. Ended up being a follow-up story in Marvel spotlight number 26 eventually they concluded it in marvel two and one he made a couple of appearances there and then completely disappeared but for some reason i see this book every time i see this book it's uh it's sought after so i figure you know what we have to find out what's the deal with dead of night number 11 so kick back relax and let's get this party started As always, we start off looking at the cover and holy Toledo and a half. It's a Gil Kane, Bernie Wrightson cover. I can only imagine that this dynamic looking piece of art here is one of the reasons why this obscure character still enjoys the kind of popularity that he does. The book opens on a good old-fashioned 1970s splash page. We see the scarecrow there, or straw man as he's going to be known. As the moon, some people in goat heads are running down the street, and it says, On a night such as this, most city dwellers hide in the shelter of their homes, afraid to respond to the slightest outside sound, afraid to get involved, afraid of themselves. Yes, there are those who do not flee from evil, but rush towards it like a moth to a candle flame. The scarecrow waits for them. And we cut to the two goat masked men breaking into an art gallery where I think they alluded to the fact that the owner of it is dead and that his security is just a touch lax. This is proven to be true by an old guard who actually threatens to shoot these guys before his gun is drawn. And the younger person says, uh, is that right, Grandpa? You know you're too old to be making threats. You can't back up. And they shoot him dead, saying, a shame you're not going to be getting any older. And as the guard falls dead, the two men talk to each other, saying, as soon as they find paintings of the Scarecrow, the cult of Kalamai will rule the world once more. Isn't that the cult that Indiana Jones went after in Temple of Doom? Now, the narrator goes and explains that these two are like children, and we see him talking. You know, I ain't seen uh, so many paintings in my whole life. Shut up, will you? Just keep looking. Sheesh, a man can't even whistle while he works anymore. Used to be that you could. Capsule study. The criminal with delusions of grandeur spending the last few moments of somewhat wasted life complaining, thus proving that he is not truly so different from the rest of us. So to me, this is kind of weird reading this. The narration seems to be off. It's almost like they're supposed to be a crypt keeper type character telling us this story because it's being told as a storyteller. So that kind of threw me off. I had to go back and check. Wait, did I miss something here? No, I didn't. This is just out of the blue, acting as if there's a crypt keeper of some sorts telling these things. The, a dead and night keeper, I don't know what you would call it. I'm not very creative. We return to the story seeing a hand fall on the shoulder of one of the men as Goat Mask comes off. He spins in his last few moments, this mouse of a man. He spins to see his personal incarnation of death. That which previously touched his tattered existence only is some nebulous abstraction, and its touch is deathly cold, and he whispers to himself, The Scarecrow! We see the man withered and dead in the Scarecrow's hands, and if the dead man had lived, perhaps he would have warned his partner. But knowing the nature of that dead man, it's doubtful his partner turns and begins to fire. So, it's Halloween time, eh, Joker? Guess I'll just have to remove your mask the hard way using jello and a whisk we see the criminal still firing at the scarecrow steel jacketed projectiles pierce cloth and if there is any earthly flesh hidden beneath 
Nothing shows to prove it. No blood sprays forth from the gaping wounds. Only puffs of dust and a few stray wisps of straw stand witness to the fact that bullets have visited the scarecrow's form. And the scarecrow quickly rushes forward towards the criminal, grabbing him and snapping his neck, killing him. Enter the Scarecrow. The Scarecrow rears back his misshapen head and laughs the laugh of a madman, his huge gaping wound of a mouth paying testament to the inhuman nature of the creature. The merciless, maniacal roar of this being who would otherwise be only a symbol of trick-or-treating hayrides and pumpkin pies would terrify the two dead men at his feet if they could hear it. He seems to enjoy these deaths, to revel in them to bathe in the waves of pain which the dying men send forth from the depths of their souls. Any sane man would look silently on this scene, unable to laugh and wonder, perhaps, what's the joke? Personally, I don't see a joke in this either. It's more a philosophy. It's Aristotle who said, don't start none, won't be none. We literally, the word says cut. We cut to an auction scene where two brothers, Dave and Jess, are bidding on the painting of the scarecrow holding those two men and they think they've got the painting in hand but a guy so freaking evil looking he should have a mustache to twirl is like hey, 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 you're gonna lose this painting and we see dave go off somewhere just like yo dave where are you going but then we come to find out maybe jess and dave are the villains of this story because dave goes over and knocks the guy down that kind of makes it so he can't bid and they even lie to the girl about what happened to the other bidder. So, yeah, maybe we're judging a little bit too hastily on these guys. So as they're waiting for the painting to be loaded on a truck, we see the guy come up. He's like, wait, I want that painting, Mr. Duncan. In one way or another, I'm going to have it. And uh, Jess is like, if you really wanted it, you would have kept bidding against me, which tells us he had absolutely zero idea Dave went over and punched him in the stomach. And the guy says, well, he's going to get the painting no matter what. And I don't know if we're supposed to really see him as the bad. Once the guy got hit, I'm sorry, my allegiances have changed. Also, we haven't found out why either one of these guys want the painting. But that's kind of settled when we find out Jess has feelings. There's mystical qualities to it that his brother Dave is going to be writing an article. And uh, he says, yeah, it shows, huh? So far, I found that the first recorded owner of the painting was religious heretic. He'd have even fallen out with the more orthodox heresies, such as the cult of Kalamai. They were believed to have had something to do with the painting centuries earlier, but exactly what has been lost to history. And he's asked, whatever happened to the cult? So the girl says, whatever happened to the cult? And Jess says, hey, that much I do know. It died out many years ago, Harmony. I guess her name is Harmony. Thank you for telling us. As far as I could tell, this painting is all that remains. And for some reason, the next caption is, Jess Duncan would have made an excellent playwright. I, I don't get it. We interrupt this exposition to say that if you do understand that particular reference, please let me know in the comments below. Also, don't forget to click like, share, subscribe. And if you can help out the channel, you think, hey, this is actually pretty good. There's a Ko-Fi link. Drop a tip in the jar. That'd be awesome. Oh, okay. The playwright thing was the beginning of what's going on here, where they say he has a marvelous sense of irony and timing. The effect is astounding as a cult thought dead for centuries even by most of its adherents comes crashing through the thick oaken doors of Jess's Duncan studio loft. The Kalumai live. And he's like, she's like, Jess. Her words seem to ask, is this another one of your childish jokes? Sadly, our invisible narrator says, it is not. And we see one of the guys in a goat mask, which is probably the dude that will get the painting at any price. Soon our Lord shall walk the earth once more. Take the painting. Jess leaps forward. No, you can't do this. And one of the muscular goat masked men hits him over the head. Jess! Harmony yells. Do not forget the girl. It's only fitting that the sacrifice which will bring our God back to life be that of she who helped steal him from our grasp. Take her. And we see Dave, Harmony. No, Harmony Maxwell, this is no joke. Man, they are really painting this Harmony chick to be a dumb, dumb blonde. You know what? Maybe I should just stop commenting on things before I read further because Dave yells, Harmony, watch out. 
and Harmony picks up a lampshade or a lamp. Don't worry, Dave, I can take care of myself. Which is more than I could say for you, friend. Duck! And she throws the lamp. You know, Harmony, Dave says as the lamp crashes into a goat-masked muscle man. All my life I've wanted to prove Jess wrong just once. Wouldn't you know I'd have such a crubby t He gets kicked. That's Dave I'm talking about. And we see Dave's head hit the floor hard. Looks like a broken neck, and we hear for a moment there is silence. And then the tension, so thick it can almost be breathed, is shattered by a final command. Take her! The bad guy we met in the beginning in a goat mask says, The fight's seemingly over. Harmony says, Uh, can I get any of you guys something to eat? I didn't think so. This time, Harmony Maxwell cannot buy her way out with humor. Maybe it's because Harmony seems to be the Hannah Gadsby of comic book humorists. And our invisible narrator continues. Against such overwhelming odds, Harmony quickly falls, and as she is dragged struggling from Jess's apartment, she glances at the two still forms that lie sprawled in the ever-deepening dusk. And since one is the form of the man she loves, the scene is doubly dark. We see that the room is empty, the two bodies are on the floor, sun seems to be coming through a skylight. The sun always seems to set more quickly when you need the light. And in the dim moon glow, two unidentified forms lie unmoving. Until one wrenches itself painfully to its feet, we see one of them get up, shambles awkwardly across the room, and exits. Cut to the cult and the villains. Oh my gosh, it's that guy. Hey, who would have ever thought? What a surprise. And he's saying, friends, the day of dawning is at hand, but in a few short moments our Lord shall walk the earth again once more alive, and not merely a painting covered over by its heretic's nightmare by this blasphemous scarecrow. In moments the canvas will stand restored to its original state, and the visage of Kalamai shall shine upon us once more. He leans down to Harmony and says, I'm sorry, my dear, but as they say, one cannot make an omelet without breaking a few eggs. She spits in his face, calls him a slime sucker. Tisk tisk, yours was going to be a painless death, but now I think that I shall rather enjoy the deed. And then we get more from the narrator. A quarter hour passes and the smell of incense engulfs the room. Candle wax drips heavily upon the floor and sonorous incantations begin to rise and fall in intensity. If not for the danger abounding in her present situation, Harmony could almost drift off to sleep. And we see the bad guy going, Hey, what? Shards of glass? Who? And we see the reason why glass is falling is because the scarecrow crashed through the skylight. This, the whole city has too many skylights. The narrator continues, If Dante had known of the Scarecrow, he would surely have included him as the taskmaster of his famous Inferno. The hand of fear tightens around the hearts of the minions of Calamai, for to see the cackling living incarnation of the painting they so despise is akin to being alone in a wax museum and to hear breathing that is not your own. It can't happen. It can't be true. But the laughter shrieking out of the Scarecrow's gaping maw cries that it is true. The Scarecrow lives. And he comes with a thousand savage servants beside him, and we see a whole bunch of crows attacking the minions of Kalamai. Talons rip open flesh, beaks scratch, streamers of blood across the room as the hell-spawn birds claim throbbing bits of flesh for their own. And through it all, any who dare to look straight into the scarecrow's eyes are instantly frozen in fear. They cannot tear their gaze from the deathly visage even as its owner quickly ends their misspent lives and we see the Scarecrow killing one of the muscle men. They fall quickly, almost too quickly, for the Scarecrow seems to be enjoying this as he knocks out or kills another one. And we cut to Gregory Rovick running outside the mansion, holding Harmony in his arms, knowing when he's been beaten. His unholy god will not help him without the prescribed drop of sacrificial blood. He flees and he is shorn of all rationalizations. He is not advancing in another direction, he's running away, or more precisely, being pushed forward by the laughter at his back, being buoyed forward by stark, unrelenting fear. Stay back, Gregory says. Stay back, or I swear the woman dies. Yes, Gregor Rovrick knows when he is beaten, and if he were a braver man, he might confront that knowledge. And we see the scarecrow bearing down upon him. 
Gregor puts a knife at her throat. Let me by or I'll slay her and her blood will be on your hands. Unfortunately, some things you do not need courage to confront because no matter which way you turn and we see a branch of a tree grab onto them, they'll confront you. No, Gregor yells. We see the trees attack Gregor and surprisingly he actually calls for the scarecrow to help as they wrap their branches around his throat. Of course, the Scarecrow doesn't help. Instead, he picks up Harmony, and the narrator says, Three days from now, the police will find the body of Gregor Rovic. Every bone will be broken. Not one muscle will be untorn. Not one organ unruptured. The police will, of course, be baffled. They will classify the death as unexplained. And as we see the dead body of Gregor and the Scarecrow walking away into the moonlight, a shame they will not know enough to classify it under its proper heading. Retribution. And we cut to, I guess, a mausoleum of some sort? It's epilogue. Sunrise and Harmony Maxwell awakens to find herself sprawled once more on the sacrificial altar. Gone is the leering sardonic scarecrow protecting her from the minions of Kalamai. Now there is only Jess Duncan and Dave Monroe kneeling beside her, shielding her from the cool morning breeze, and they wake her up. And while she doesn't want to talk about the assault that happened to her, she does tell Jess that she's sorry that they've destroyed the painting. To which Jess replies, my painting? You must have been dreaming, Harmony. No one's damaged the painting. There's nothing wrong with it at all. And then they say, well, I don't think he was smiling before. Jess Duncan's only response is silence. A terrible, terribly long silence. So there you go, gang. That's the first appearance of Marvel's second Scarecrow character. And they did, like I said, name him Straw Man going forward. But Scarecrow is what he started off with. Didn't talk. As a matter of fact, this is a weird situation to be in. This book was enjoyable without being particularly good. If uh, And yes, I do understand that some people think that that's a contradiction. I do not. I think some things can be enjoyable without being excellent or good or, or just so on and so forth. I do believe that this is a very simple story. We don't know who the Scarecrow is. We don't exactly know why he does what he wants what he does so there's a lot of story left on the table and the only characters we're supposed to relate to actually did something criminal at the beginning to the person that we're supposed to feel bad for i don't think that was a good idea as far as the story was concerned but yet i still want to see more of this character i would follow the scarecrow had there been more scare scarecrow to follow but that's just my opinion what is yours let me know in the comments below and if you like this video check out one of the other ha halloween videos we've done i think you'll enjoy that and uh, uh especially for the season it's good anytime but especially for the season also don't forget to click like share subscribe ring the notification bell if you haven't done it already and drop a dollar in our tip jar over at ko-fi links in the description below like thank everybody who's already done that to everyone all of the true believers Thank you very, very much for watching.